Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, I'd also like to pay my respects to the Nulwa and Nambri people, whose existence growing up in Canberra as a child I was totally unaware of, it has to be said. Um, and really, um, although we did know a, a few um, Aboriginal kids when I was a teenager who were the children, the daughters of public servants um, here in Canberra. So I, I, I can't follow that act with a song, <laughs> although I, I had a vivid memory while you were singing that my mother used to write um, ad advertising copy for 2CA radio, and she used to have to fit the concept into 15 seconds or 13, 30 seconds, depending how much was spent. And we used to sometimes have to do things like uh, um, provide jungle noises for uh, an advertisement. Um, but so thank you. Thank you for the song. All right, I, I need to say uh, that my little talk um, draws upon a um, huge amount of research that I've been doing on the family home. Uh, where is it? Roger, can you project your voice to the back? Thank you. Oh, I can, I can try. If yeah. you step out just a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, the family home, the so-called uh, Benjamin House, which was one of the first um, buildings to be registered uh, under the sort of heritage provisions. That happened in, in 2003, although it was nominated back in the 90s by, by Graham Trickett, the architect and historian. Um, I'm writing a book, and I've basically finished it. If anybody would like to publish it, please step forward. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, a, it's quite a big book of 50,000 odd words, a couple of hundred illustrations, and um, you know, watch this space maybe a year or two before it actually uh, comes out. But it's been very interesting for me to do some non-academic uh, writing that is partly based in memory as well as uh, researching um, the life of the architect, Alex Jelinek, um, who, who designed it. Um, my parents also, and, and thank you, Jeff, for that historical background, um, you know, which will serve all of uh, as sort of context for for the establishment of Canberra, which I don't know need to go into. Uh, my dad, who's up there, was a uh, an academic. Uh, both of my parents were Melbourne people, since you ask. Uh, mm -hmm. They are Melbourne people they're from the Anglo-Jewish community. They'd been there since the foundation of the city, really 1830s. Um, and they were sort of, money had been made and they were the intellectuals who sort of followed on. And Bruce, my father, uh, studied philosophy at Melbourne Uni straight after the war, went to Oxford for his higher degree um, with Audrey, who you see there. And that's me, I do love this photograph of myself. <laughs> it, it's tragic what's happened, but <laughs> that, you know, it does somehow happen to us all. Now, so what was tragic, actually, and to bring a serious note, is that, that my father, um, having um, been the patron for this fascinating house that was built in 1957, died in 63, the beginning of 63, at the age of 38. My mother decided to stay with the four children in that same house um, and bring us up. And I've just been reflecting in the last day or two more broadly, what that decision meant was it provided a kind of stability. So I've got continuity and loss. The loss was the, the absence of the father, but the continuity was the house which I was able to grow up in until I left for university. And, and all of my siblings, we all grew up in this one place. The other um, great source of continuity was my school. I don't think much about the school. Now, in retrospect, you see I had an afro back in the day. <laughs> That's me over there. And actually, we were allowed to do that in the very um, early 70s at, at the stuffy old Canberra Grammar School. I, I got a solid education. Um, I didn't like the old neo-Gothic buildings that were built from the, in the late 20s. But I, I rejoiced, and I now remember actually seeing these brick walls go up as a very small boy. Um, we used to love that, um, that chapel, and I used to sing in it. Um, so the school uh, provided a second source of uh, stability and, and continuity 
um, a, as life went on. Um, the Benjamin House, uh, I'm not going to say so much about it really, except perhaps to mention that in respect to this photograph, one of my chapters is called uh, Living in Geometry. Uh, and it is, uh, it was a fascinating experience and I'm quite sure helped form me um, in a sort of aesthetic sense to be in, in a, spending most of your time in a house where there were no regular voids at all. There were no rectangles, uh, there were curves, there were strange uh, unexpected spaces and it, uh, it, it, it was um, delightful. My father was a car nut and uh, in this car he held the record for driving between Melbourne and Canberra something over six hours which is <laughs> terrifying given that the roads weren't even sealed back then. <laughs> uh, it is interesting to think about how motor vehicles parked next to high modernist buildings you know give the light of a sense that um, uh, confuses our sense of temporality really. So the young man, 33 year old Yellowneck drove that old sort of bomb Buick, come up from Melbourne, and, and Dad had this, and he used to drive me, in the two years before he said, he drove me to primary school in this car, which was a kind of unforgettable experience. In fact, there's one on eBay, uh, or Gumtree, there's one for sale. Um, it's only $280,000. <laughs> So the young man as an SC, there I am. Um, these are the formal photographs that the architect commissioned and were executed by Wolfgang Sievers, the preeminent Melbourne architectural photographer. And it was very clever of Yellowneck because these were so publishable and they were published in France and Australia. They helped win House of the Year for a Melbourne um, architectural prize. Uh, so I grew up, I mean, I, I, looking back, extraordinarily privileged. It was a very privileged background and, I, I, you know, what can I say, I'm very lucky. I've gone on to become a professor of art history and hopefully I'm giving something back to the people who come to our classes at Sydney Uni and so on. So we grew up, Dad collected fair weather and um, at one point, he, while he was alive, he had about six paintings. Um, we don't have any of them now, but I, it wasn't quite this print, but a print very like it. When I came home from school every day, you climbed the stairs and there was this beautiful face of a woman by Matisse, and I'm a Matisse scholar. And quite clearly to me, you know, the two are connected. It was this sort of, uh, sort of primary experience of, of looking at the image of a human face designed by this um, this master of the simple line, as my, my mother explained. She wasn't into brown, please excuse me. <laughs> she, she became a, she loved Andy Worrell, as she called him, Andy Worrell. And, uh, and uh, she loved the Beatles and Psychedelia. And this is her sort of Sergeant Pepper's room, really. An extension that she did to the house, the first and not quite calamitous, but the first important addition to the house was at that time. And you can see from the furniture, I'm sorry for the, um, the homewares, uh, similarly to the, the previous speaker that uh, mum used to shop at Flair in the Style Arcade in, in um, Monica. Um, as I was thinking through what my remarks should say, I mean, there were certain buildings around the city that, that formed, uh, they had a kind of iconic status for me personally. I have very vivid memories of, of the interior of the, of the Canberra Theatre before it was buggered up um, by, what was it, postmodernism? Yeah. Um, <laughs> all those accretions, I mean the square itself now, you can hardly move <laughs> in the square. Um, and of course this is the logo of our friends from Canberra Modern very witty. Look, here's the Civic Olympic pool before the lake. In fact, <coughs> me and Jeff are what I call anti-diluvians, people born before the flood. <laughs> <laughs> and I have strong memories of the excavation of Adelaide Avenue. So our house was about 
400 metres, 300 metres that way. And I, it was so exciting, very, very noisy, that I used to get mum to take me in the car to watch the huge machines go up and down, it's the big scrapers and bulldozers and stuff. So you need, a, I mean, obviously to do this properly, you need um, an oral dimension. You need, music is absolutely all important, I think, um, in understanding how memory works, certainly in my case. Uh, and the loss of classic buildings, um, the, the Hotel Civic uh, was a famous building and a, it, it disappeared and the first of the ugly uh, high modern sky rises went in here and I think since then that's been changed, has it not? At least once or twice. Uh, but fortunately we have the, the Melbourne and the Sydney buildings still. So as I say at the top, Heraclitus, the only constant is change. Uh, this was the, that's the space that was filled in by my mother in 68 to make room for this kind of activity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And there we go. So uh, I go into this at length in the book, but I'm not going to say much about it at all, but the house was changed. It left my family's hands in 82, mum sold it. It was owned by two families through the 80s and then the 90s and changed in very many ways. Uh, and then an opportunity came up at the very end of 1999 to buy the house back, which I did, and, and myself and my then wife and little kids, we lived there for three years before going to Sydney, then we rented it for a while, then we had to sell it, ultimately. But this is how it looks now, good for the next century. That's the name of my last chapter. Um, <coughs> it's, it's been beautifully fixed up, and uh, uh, I'm uh, you know, a, a passionate advocate for high modernist architecture, um, and what it can do, what good it can do to your soul. And that's it, thank you.